So today I'm going to be talking about uh, philosophy and, and disagreement. Um, and I, I want to start um, with two contrasting stereotypes of the philosopher, two images of a philosophy and the people who do it that you might associate with the word philosopher. Uh, so the, uh, the first of them is the one that you often see in uh, cartoons um, of a philosopher, is the, the, the guru uh, sitting by himself, because uh, it normally is a, a he uh, on that stereotype, by himself on top of a mountain, uh, speaking uh, words of wisdom. Uh, and then the the contrasting stereotype with that is two philosophers uh, disputing uh, without end, interminably with with each other, um, arguing away of, and um, maybe uh, disagreeing in some um, lively, possibly even violent way. Um, so. The first kind of philosophy uh, is naturally expressed from a literary point of view in, in the form of uh, enigmatic uh, aphorisms, sayings of the philosopher that are uh, short and um, somewhat mysterious, a bit like uh, the, the um, sayings of an oracle. Um, and in in ancient Greece, the the paradigm of that kind of philosophy might be someone like um, Heraclitus, uh, at least what what is preserved of him is, is just consists of these kind of aphorisms, which are just said and then and then uh, you have to make of them what you can. Um, whereas uh, the the second kind of philosophy is naturally expressed in the form of a dialogue. Um, with two or more voices, and of course, the the ancient Greek uh, example of of that uh, is Socrates, or um, who was famous just for doing philosophy by talking with with other people, um, not by writing at all. Although, of course, the uh, what we have of him is is uh, Socrates as uh, written down by by Plato, which is, probably doesn't fully correspond to the original Socrates. Um, And if if we if we think of um, contemporary analytic uh, philosophers, uh, their style is much closer to the second stereotype than to the first. To the, the philosophers arguing with each other rather than speaking uh, words of uh, wisdom. Um, maybe some contemporary non-analytic philosophers are a little bit further on. Uh, on the spectrum towards the, the guru uh, end. Um, now, just to comment on the, the contrast, uh, I mean, very obviously on the, the second model, the model with philosophers disputing with each other, philosophy, it's, it's explicitly uh, a social activity, um, something that people do with each other, not just by themselves. But uh, even on the, the first model, uh, philosophy is implicitly uh, social because it's, it's part of that stereotype that the, uh, the guru it has followers uh, who, uh, who climb the mountain to listen to his words of wisdom. And as I said, the stereotypical guru is male. Uh, so that they can then spread them around and gain new followers for him. I mean, there's not much point in the uh, the guru just speaking wise words on top of the the mountain if if no one is is listening. So in a way, they um, they both illustrate the the social aspect of philosophy, but in different ways. Um, and. I think I think this is quite a significant aspect of philosophy that, uh, as a social activity, philosophy takes place in a medium of communication, which is is normally uh, a language, normally a natural language, occasionally a, a formal artificial language, um, and of course, occasionally we we do use other media of communication than language, using uh, diagrams, maybe gestures, 
there are even cases of uh, philosophers who who try to uh, convey their ideas by by dancing. Um, but th those are all forms of uh, communication. Uh, and of course, the dominant one in uh, most philosophical traditions is uh, language. Um, whereas uh, thinking thoughts privately in one's own head um, is, is not yet a contribution to philosophy. So as it were, it, it, it's a, a false uh, idea that somehow the, the thinking of the deep thoughts itself is, is a philosophical activity. It's, it's crucial to philosophy that it has this social uh, aspect, which is also, of course, what enables there to be uh, philosophical traditions in which ideas are passed down from one generation to another. Um, and of course, we shouldn't pretend that this is <coughs> something that's exclusive to uh, to philosophy. I mean, the, the the same thing applies to uh, science and and indeed to any um, intellectual uh, discipline. That that these all have a social aspect, um, and in in all these cases, of course, we couldn't have a tradition w without some form of communication. And in in all cases, the, the contribution to the discipline consists uh, in uh, in what one contributes uh, to this communication. It does not consist in itself in the um, just the thinking of deep thoughts or something like that. Now, I want to reflect a little bit more on the differences between uh, the the two kinds of social activity in the uh, the two uh, models uh, of uh, philosophy, the two stereotypes. Um, so, if we think about the the guru follower uh, model, it's uh, it's social, but it's socially uh, asymmetric. The followers they defer to the guru. They they put themselves in a pupil teacher relation to to the, him or as it might be her um, whereas the guru does not defer to the, the followers so there's an asymmetry in their relationship um, whereas it, in the, the the model the stereotype of philosophy as represented by two philosophers disputing with each other that's a socially uh, symmetric model. Um, the disputants are not deferring to each other. Um, they're disputing as more or less uh, equal partners. Of course, it, it's, it may not be perfectly uh, symmetric. And if you think of the, the case of uh, Socrates, uh, he, he liked uh, to be the, the one asking the questions, and so there was a, a little bit of asymmetry between uh, him and uh, his interlocutors because because he was asking the questions and they were answering them. Uh, but it was still um, much closer to a, a socially symmetric relationship uh, than than the guru uh, follower model. Even though, of course, famously Socrates uh, was came from. Uh, a, a lower class family, and so in in that sense, in in terms of the the social hierarchy, there was an asymmetry between him and the people that he was talking to, but but much less so uh, in in their uh, dialogues. Um, so, you know, one can think about the advantages and disadvantages of um, of these two models. Uh, and the guru follower model um, seems to fit the initial, the early stages of uh, the teacher pupil relationship. Um, when, I mean, pupils who dispute everything their teacher says, I mean, they may, they may never uh, learn anything. Um, if, they, if, they, if they come that thinking that they're already that they already understand things better than their teacher, then they're, they're not likely to learn from their teacher. 
Um, but but that model uh, doesn't work so well for later stages of the the pupil uh, teacher relationship. Um, but as the pupils uh, learn learn more, they they may realize uh, errors in what their teacher says, um, and, um, and and the good teacher will listen to their objections and responds to them on their merits. That's to say, um, will not automatically uh, correct the the student because it may be that the student is right and that the teacher is wrong, and. Um, and the the bad teacher is the one who overrules the pupils' objections and does not respond to them on their merits. Just as when treats it as automatic that the teacher is right and the pupil is wrong. And and I think it, it's clear that both sides uh, learn much more from the uh, the first kind of exchange than from the the second. And I say both sides because. Um, I think in a productive relationship between a teacher and at least a relatively advanced pupil, the teacher is learning from the the pupil as as well as uh, the the other way round. And certainly, that's that's one of my uh, pleasures in uh, in teaching at uh, at Oxford. That I can, I've got a lot of good students, and I can learn something from them as well as I hope being able to teach them uh, something. Um, And I, I think it's it's relevant uh, to recall um, something about the the discussion of evidence in lecture one, uh, which is relevant uh, here. So um, one moral I was drawing there is that all our sources of evidence are fallible. Um, so that I mean they're capable of producing something which. Uh, it may be presented as evidence, but in fact is false, or at least uh, is is uh, uh, it's not known whether it's true or, or false, and so it doesn't constitute evidence. Um, and so, um, because all our sources of evidence are, are fallible, we must be ready to recognise that something we had treated as known and therefore as evidence uh, is false or doubtful. And um, so in either case, not known and not uh, evidence. Um, and, and so uh, since uh, people can be sources of evidence through testimony, uh, no teacher is an infallible source of evidence. Um, and I, I think it's, Im it's important that, uh, that the pupils after a certain stage, uh, particularly when, once they're... Um, adults or close to being adults, that they realize that their teacher is, is fallible. And, and I think one aspect of this um, is uh, that, uh, as an English historian once said, all, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, um, that Someone who's treated as um, a guru, treated in effect as infallible, um, an infallible source of evidence, is thereby um, granted power over their pupils, and, and that power can corrupt. Um, and I think one aspect of this, the, as well the more intellectual aspect, um, is that if one's treated as infallible, one's much more likely to stop worrying about um, the danger of error and, and being much more, much more careless about what one says. And um, I mean, so in other words, you're, you're much more likely to make mistakes if you know that what you say will not be challenged. And, and that's one of the respects in which teachers benefit from pupils who are ready to dispute with them. I mean, when, when I'm teaching a, a class uh, with good graduate students in Oxford or el elsewhere, um, I mean, I know that, that if I say something wrong, they're very likely to pick it up and, and point out the, the mistake. And that's, 
that's good for me. And, um, and of course, pupils benefit from teachers who are ready to be disputed with. Um, and by challenging their teacher and maybe by finding out that the pupil is right or by finding out that the teacher is right, which can be either, uh, the pupils learn much more from the exchange. And of course, an, another way um, in, in which the two disputants model of philosophy uh, is needed is um, that there's more than one teacher and even more than one guru in the in the world, and uh, and so we need some kind of model for what happens when they encounter uh, each other, and it, it, that is the the two disputants model that that we don't all stand in some kind of linear hierarchy where anyone you talk to is is either stands in a teacher-pupil relationship to you or to a pupil-teacher relationship to you, where, where in many cases where um, even, as it were, from an institutional point of view, uh, we're talking to each other on a footing of equality. Um, this... This social aspect of philosophy, although it's very, it's it's in fact very visible in contemporary philosophy, but um, in the way that that philosophical uh, problems are formulated, uh, the the social aspect has been somewhat um, marginalised, and and so um, one can see this, for example, in in the way that um, that paradoxes are studied. So. If you if you look at the way paradoxes are formulated and presented in uh, contemporary philosophy, uh, what you tend to get is logicians putting them in the form of logical arguments, typically from common sense premises or premises that seem obviously true, um, to um, which then seem to, by logically valid steps, lead to. Uh, contradictions or absurdities, and and classic examples of these are the liar paradox, the the, the person, roughly speaking, saying uh, that uh, what I am now saying is not true, um, or the paradoxes of uh, vagueness, the Sorites paradox, where if you have a if you a heap and you take one grain away, you still have a heap, but but if you repeat that process ten thousand times, that then you may be left with one grain or zero or whatever, and yet you've got a, a, a premise which seems to be telling you that if, if you had a, a heap before you took the grain away, then you still have a heap after you took the uh, grain away. And, but those are simply put in terms of abstract arguments in contemporary philosophy. But um, those paradoxes originated, as far as we know, in ancient Greece, and the, the Greeks put those paradoxes typically in the form of questions and answer dialogues, little Dialogues like you know, if you have uh, ten thousand grains, does that make a heap? And then the the answer is supposed to say yes. And then if you take one grain away, do you still have a heap? And they say yes. And and they they get into, into trouble with paradoxes of vagueness um, in that way through through a dialogue rather than through uh, a, a logically formulated uh, argument with with premises and conclusion. Um, and so it, it, in in ancient Greece. Um, the the social aspect of of these uh, paradoxes was uh, was much more uh, overt than it is in contemporary uh, philosophy. But I, I I think when when we consider the the use of logical arguments in philosophy, you you see that there there is. Um, a social aspect to it, and um, and that aspect actually is is quite significant for the way that we do things with with arguments. So, um, so even supposing you're using a logical argument to convince someone of a conclusion, um, then you, you're going to need to to choose the premises. Um, 
as ones which the hero will accept, um, because if they don't accept the premises, that, that then obviously they're not, they won't have to accept the uh, conclusion. And so there's uh, an implicitly social aspect there in the choice of premises. Um, and and that that also forces the, the person who's uh, constructing the argument, um, it motiva- or at least motivates them to imagine how things look from the other person's percep- perspective so that they can see what kind of argument will seem weighty from the other person's point of view, what kind of uh, argument um, will will ha- have premises which they which they will accept um, and uh, and I think this is this is particularly important in relation to um, issues about the uh, what are called fallacies of argumentation um, I mean there's a kind of standard list of such uh, fallacies which goes back to the uh, ancient uh, Greece uh, to ancient Greece but um, and people th- often assume that these fallacies are something which is studied in formal logic. But in fact, uh, they're actually quite difficult to relate in many cases to formal uh, logic uh, because um, they implicitly depend on the social aspect of argumentation, which of course is something that in formal logic we we usually, not always, but usually completely abstract from. so, I mean, here's an uh, example um, that, I, I mean, there's a fallacy of um, what's called begging the question, um, where you, you accuse somebody of begging the, the question, and, and, uh, and that's supposed to be a really bad thing about the, the, the argument that they're offering. Um, I mean, the, the paradigm of begging the question is where um, the the conclusion is actually identical with the premise. So it's an argument of the form P, therefore P. But uh, of course, in practice, you you very rarely get something that is as crude as that. I mean, normally, um, in some way, um, the, the, the premise, it looks different from the, the, con- the conclusion, but it's actually much closer to the conclusion uh, than is uh, appropriate or something like that. Um, and so people have tried um, to define the fallacy of begging the question in this more general sense where it doesn't require that the premise and the conclusion actually be identical. Uh, they've tried to define it in purely logical terms. But what typically happens with such attempts um, is that they they imply that all logically valid arguments beg the question, which, of course, <coughs> is a disaster because um, it means uh, that that the accusation of begging the question, it, it, I mean, it can't be a, a fallacy in any objectionable sense if, if it's a property that, uh, that all logically valid uh, arguments possess. Um, and I mean, not, I'm not going to, to go into the details here, but I think it's pretty clear that um, to understand what's wrong with this um, committing this um, so-called fallacy of begging the question, uh, one has to consider what, what's needed to persuade someone who does not already accept uh, the conclusion to persuade one persuade them to to accept the conclusion. Uh, and so it, it's really it's really diff- difficult to make sense of this fallacy of begging the question without getting quite serious about the um, the social aspect of argumentation, the, the fact that it's uh, an attempt to uh, persuade someone of something. Of course, you know, sometimes one devises arguments uh, just to, um, to convince uh, oneself of something. But, um, but even there, I th- there's a kind of social aspect. I mean, that you're, that you're, as it were, talking to yourself. And and I think without without understanding even that kind of social aspect, it's, it's difficult to make sense of what's going on uh, with um, the problem of of begging the question. Um, 
So I want now to start thinking about the issue of the relation between the social aspect of um, of philosophy and agreement and disagreement. Um, so, of course, social cooperation often requires agreement on what to do. And um, and since I've been talking about persuasion and so on, it, it's one natural hypothesis is that argumentation uh, aims at uh, agreement. Um, now, sometimes it's not important what we agree on, which alternative we take, as long as we do agree with each other. Uh, and the the classic example of that uh, is the case of uh, conventions. And I mean, more generally, this has to do with the coordination of behavior. So uh, the simple example is um, it doesn't matter whether everyone drives on the, the right or everyone drives on the left, that it's it's arbitrary. But the important thing is that everyone drives on the same side of the road. Um, and and so as we're there, agreement is the, the primary thing that you're aiming at. But in most cases, agreement is not a matter of pure convention. So to take a kind of intermediate uh, case, um, suppose that we have a group of friends who are deciding which restaurant they're going to go to uh, together to have, them to have dinner. Um, so it does matter whether everyone goes to the same restaurant, but that's not the only thing that matters. Uh, it also matters um, whether we all go to a nice restaurant or we all go to a nasty, horrible restaurant. Uh, and so there's... A, a, there's something that's required um, beyond simple coordination with each other. And in science and uh, philosophy, there's, there's, there's not much merit in everyone agreeing on a theory if the theory is in fact worse, e.g. E it's further from the truth, than the alternatives. Um, and I mean, the fact that uh, agreement produces uh, harmony in the community of scientists or philosophers uh, is is much less important than uh, than whether they're agreeing on uh, something that's that's correct or something that's uh, incorrect. Um, and I, I think that um, too much uh, emphasis. Uh, is is laid uh, on uh, agreement in uh, in discussing these um, these matters. Um, so, if agreement uh, were our only aim, uh, we might be able to achieve it by uh, agreeing to to that we gather no more evidence and and we do no more thinking about the issues. We we just stay where we are with the evidence that we already have um, and. The, the thoughts that we've already got. Um, suppose that we've ma all managed to, to attain some kind of agreement, then we might feel, let's not um, endanger this uh, agreement by, by doing any more thinking or gathering any more evidence. Um, and, and in fact, in some circumstances, the desire for agreement can lead us to ignore or suppress inconvenient evidence um, or inconvenient doubts about what we take to be evidence or inconvenient uh, thoughts. And, and there um, we, we have the, the danger of um, too much uh, emphasis being put on um, conformity and not enough uh, on what we're uh, conforming to. Um, by the way, I, I should mention here as well that um, dis disagreement is not always such a, a terrible matter. Even in cases where the disagree, we we know that the disagreement um, can't be uh, resolved. So, for example, um, if you take the 
disagreement between um, people who who follow the theory of evolution of natural selection uh, versus um, let's say religiously motivated um, fundamentalists who who accept some creationist uh, story. Um, I think it's safe to say that 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 neither side there will ever convince uh, the other that they're wrong. But that doesn't mean that that there is no knowledge in that case. I mean, in fact, I mean, the, the uh, it is the the evil evolutionary biologists, I take it, who know the the truth in that uh, case, even though there are people that they can't convince. So, um, agreement. I mean, the lack of agreement isn't a doesn't have to be a sign that there is that there's no knowledge there. Um, so I, I think the the thing to go back to, which also came up in the the first lecture, is that science and philosophy are driven by uh, curiosity, the the appetite for knowledge, not just uh, belief. Now, of course, if everyone knows the answer to a question, they're all going to agree on that answer because um, all knowledge is true. Um, but but what matters is not the agreement, the shared belief, but the shared knowledge. It's because it's knowledge that's shared rather than belief. That is, that's a crucial thing. Um, and so uh, agreement, I mean, it can, it can be a manifestation of the fact that everybody knows the truth, but it can also be a manifestation of, let's say, some pressure to, uh, to conformity of a kind which may actually be uh, opposed to the acquisition of knowledge. Um, and, and so given that, that premature agreement uh, is often an obstacle uh, to knowledge, um, I, I think a disposition to argumentation, to dis disputation, that's often a way to prevent premature agreement. And in the long run, to make it more likely that we'll reach knowledge. Um, but there's an aspect of this that some people are very uneasy about, um, because arguing is typically a competitive activity. I mean, we do speak uh, of um, somebody winning or losing an argument. Um, and there's also, uh, it, at least in analytic philosophy, there's, there's, there's terminology for a draw. It's, it's called a standoff. Um, you know, when people sometimes say it's a standoff where they're kind of offering a draw to their, their opponent, they're saying, all right, let's, let's agree that neither of us has won or lost this. Um, and that, but we might think, well, surely philosophy and science and social activities should be cooperative and, and not uh, competitive. Now, I think that's a very uh, superficial uh, argument uh, because it's, it's treating the, the distinction between the competitive and cooperative as if it were just uh, all at one uh, level. So, uh, you know, a simple example of this uh, is it, if you think of the the game of chess, uh, it's of course it's competitive. There's winning and losing, um, but if you have a chess club, that's a cooperative enterprise. That's people cooperating together so that they can they can play uh, chess. Uh, in fact, even a single game of uh, chess is in fact typically a cooperative um, activity in the sense that that the two players are cooperating so that they can both play this game. Um, and th the hypothesis that I'm interested in is, is that uh, philosophical disputes are competitive, um, but that philosophy through disputes, a philosophy which as it were employs disputation uh, as a, a central feature is nevertheless a cooperative uh, enterprise. In fact, the the contrast between chess and an intellectual activity, of course, is is not is not so um, 
extreme as you might uh, think, because um, I mean the role of uh, of knowledge in chess is kind of obvious, and uh, and uh, by playing a game, both sides are are gaining knowledge of uh, of chess. Uh, and in fact, if you were to formalize chess, you you, you would realize that um, that the che- that, uh, well, the chess knowledge. I mean, where it's knowledge of you know w- w- whether a given position um, is is a winning side for for the white or or black. That I mean, that's that's fundamentally a kind of uh, applied mathematics. Um, not it's not particularly n- numerical, but it, but in a more abstract sense of mathematics, it's actually just a branch of mathematics. So n- now, if we're going to think of um, argumentation as part of this. Uh, uh, overarching cooperative enterprise aimed at knowledge. Uh, we we need to think about how competitive disputes serve the search for knowledge, um, because each side is aiming at winning. They're not uh, aiming at finding the truth in the particular argument. Um, I mean that. I mean, of course, it, this depends a bit on the psychology of the people who are arguing, but I, I think it's it's very obvious that um, in many, many uh, arguments uh, in philosophy, and of course, not only in philosophy, in uh, all sorts of other areas too, um, the, the, the arguers are focused mainly on the issue of winning the argument. And of course, some people find this very distressing, um, they, stressful, and maybe unworthy, um, and that philosophers should not be like that. But the fact is that often they are. Um, so, so I think one thing to emphasize about this is, is that it is not an exclusive feature of uh, philosophy. For example, natural science has has a similar competitive aspect, though it's not played out so much in terms of just verbal argumentation. Um, although, of course, that does happen in uh, quite a lot in science. But um, maybe a more striking manifestation of it is where you have research teams racing against each other p- to be the first to a discovery. You might think of the um, the current um, research aimed at, f- at finding a vaccine uh, for the, uh, COVID-19. Um, and that, I think it's pretty, a pretty safe bet that there is a, a seriously competitive aspect to the psychology of the, the people involved in that. Um, but that isn't necessarily such a bad thing because... Um, the competitive aspect of science uh, increases motivation, and and that may drive uh, discovery. And, and where human beings are, and human beings' motives are, are very rarely uh, pure. But um, but if we can in some way harness the impure motivations to a good cause, such as finding a vaccine, um, then then that's a much more realistic way of dealing with the impure motivation than by some completely unrealistic ideal of just eliminating all impure motives from from science. Um, And of course, uh, as is famous, I mean, there are are extreme cases where competitiveness in science uh, leads to to cheating and and, and fraud. Uh, I mean, Cases have come out where where people have been um, falsifying uh, the uh, the results of their uh, experiments in in way, one way or another. Um, but but I think that the realistically the the way to handle that is not by trying to uh eliminate all impure motives from the science but by having a good system of controls uh w- controls uh 
which, which are good at detecting um, cheating and fraud so that they're unlikely to be rewarded. Uh, and once we've got a good system of controls, that then um, in general, competitiveness serves the search for truth in the sense that um, the, the best competitive strategy is just to do the science as well as you can. And I'm going to suggest that something of the same kind applies to uh, philosophy too. Um, so in the case of philosophy, given how, how much of the, the competitive aspect of it uh, takes a form of uh, argumentation, um, what we need is a good system of controls to prevent cheating in argument. Um, and given such a system, uh, competitiveness serves the search for, for truth. So, for example, we, we don't want it to be the case that the person with the, the loudest voice wins, and we don't want it to be the case uh, that uh, the person who can uh, speak most quickly uh, wins. But naturally, the... Um, the kinds of cheating that are, are much more dangerous in, in philosophy are not ones that are as crude and obvious as, as those, um, but, but subtler ones. And so we need controls on those. Uh, we need controls on um, cheating by, in some way, presenting arguments which seem to be logically valid, but in fact are not, for example, which, and of course, very often the, the person who's presenting them doesn't realize that they're not. Um, so, you know, I think uh, one partial analogy, um, which is uh, worth thinking about, um, is with uh, adversarial systems in the, in the law. Um, so many legal systems use such an adversarial system um, to structure uh, court cases. Um, so there's a, a lawyer or a team of lawyers, a legal team for, for each side. Uh, in a criminal case, um, one side is the, the prosecution and one side is the uh, defense. Um, now, the lawyer's role is to make the strongest possible case for their side, not to do their best to find the, the truth. I mean, lawyers, for example, they're not supposed to point out ways in which uh, the evidence is act actually goes against their side, but um, that's the job for the other side to point out. Um, so what one role of the judge in a court case that has that uh, structure is uh, to be there as an umpire or, or referee uh, to prevent uh, cheating. Um, and, and then the verdict is uh, decided by, an, well, what's supposed to be an impartial uh, jury or, or judge, or in cases where there's no jury, it's typically a, a, a several judges. Um, so the system as a whole is aimed at finding the truth in, in these cases. That's, that's what it's job is to do. But the, but the idea is that, that the best way of doing that is on the basis of competition between the strongest arguments on each side. So that, as it were, if, if you have uh, each side with, with lawyers who are motivated to, to find the strongest arguments for that side, then that's the, the best way of uh, eliciting the, the full case on uh, each side. And, and I think that's a, a model um, for dispute, that we could consider for disputation in uh, ph philosophy. And it's worth thinking about the similarities and, uh, and differences. Uh, and of course, it, it makes it very obvious that this is a fallible model. Uh, it's, it's clear that sometimes um, the, the wrong side can win in a in a court case, um, and 
this is not pretending otherwise for the, the case of uh, philosophy. Um, so, uh, I mean, one difference between these two cases is that l- lawyers um, typically argue on whichever side is, is paying them or that they've been assigned to, um, ir- irrespective of their personal opinions. So their motives might be, well, the more honorable one is duty to their client, but but it will we can assume that they're also concerned with things like their reputation, their career, their money, and uh, so on. Um, whereas philosophers are typically invested in the truth of their case, um, and and they rarely change their their mind, which is a manifestation partly of of that. Although, of course, you know, being r- realistic, um, philosophers are also to some extent motivated by uh, considerations of reputation and career and and money, which is uh, consequent on on those, because philosophers are, are human. Um, what we don't have a very close equivalent of in philosophy is the, the jury or the judges. Um, but to some extent, the community of professional philosophers uh, plays a similar uh, role in, as a word, deciding, um, well, who won that argument and, and who didn't. So we, we, there's a bit of that g- going on, but it's certainly much, um, much less, um, as it were, institutionalized than, than in the case of the, the law. Um, Now, one aspect of this is that philosophers are typically rather unwilling to change their entrenched theoretical attitudes. Um, I mean, there are there are some philosophers who who are kind of famous for how often they change their mind. Um, so, and, and one example of that is Bertrand Russell. Uh, another is uh, more recently, uh, Hilary Putnam. Um, I mean, these are people who put forward very different uh, views at different points uh, in their in their life. But but that's uh, unusual, and that's why it's so remarked on in their cases. Uh, it's what you tend to find are philosophers who um, who stick with very similar views over the course of their uh, professional. Careers and certainly in my own case, I, I'm not somebody who's changed my mind a great uh, deal over the say the last thirty years. Um, now, of course, it, you know one can be very worried about the fact that ph- philosophers are so unwilling to change their minds, and you know, in, in a way, uh, they seem to be. Um, very close-minded in a way that we might feel is inappropriate for a philosopher. But in a different respect, th- th- those kind of attitudes actually strengthen the adversarial system. Um, they, they help the community to explore thoroughly the resources, the inter- intellectual resources of their favoured theories to meet explanatory and other challenges so that theories are not abandoned uh, prematurely. Um, so that, as it were, there's actually some value in, in having people who are kind of obstinate and um, very, very reluctant ever to admit that they're wrong. Um, and in this respect, philosophies not so different from natural science. Um, so, in this, his famous book from the early 1960s, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Kuhn, in effect, explains how irrationally strong theoretical commitments at the level of individual scientists can combine into a rational enterprise at the level of the scientific community. Um, so, you know, on his picture, you have the 
older f- scientists who are backing the, the the old theory, who are who are very very unwilling to give it up, even when the evidence is against them. And you may, have, but younger scientists who may be um, somewhat very very reluctant to give up the new idea, even though it seems to be facing all sorts of very difficult challenges. Um, and on Kuhn's view, it, it's really important to have as it were, both the obstinate old scientists and the obstinate new ones, because most scientific theories face serious anomalies, which may often take many, many years, more, more than a person's lifetime, perhaps, to, to resolve. And, and so we need some mechanism for uh, people investing in theories, even when things are looking rather black for the, uh, the theory, um, so that... Um, those theories are not abandoned when there is, in fact, um, or there may be uh, some way that they can explain the anomaly. But as well, they need, we need scientists who are willing to stick to the theory long enough to 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 find the, and are strongly motivated enough to find those answers. Um, so there's a a comment which is attributed to the physicist Mac. Max Planck, um, who, which is that progress in science is measured by uh, funerals. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure whether he actually said that, but he certainly um, made comments to the same uh, effect. And um, th- his idea was that what happens when there's a scientific revolution and an old theory is is um, abandoned and a new theory it takes its place is that the the old obsolete theories that they're not uh, abandoned by their defenders the defenders t- typically hold on to the theory and refuse to admit that it's wrong what happens is just that they're the old the defenders of the old theory die and um, a new defenders of the old theory are not recruited. The the new people entering the, the profession uh, all go for the uh, the new theory. So as roughly speaking, students deciding where they're going to do their PhDs, um, they don't want to work on a degenerating research program in the sense of the philosopher of science, Imre Lakatosh, um, because, because it, their career is going to go very badly if they're, if they're uh, committed to uh, uh, such a research program. And at the point where they're deciding where to do their PhDs, they, they can, they're fairly open-minded, certainly much more open-minded than the, the older professors uh, about um, which are, are promising research programs and, and which are not. So, so that the, it's the students entering the discipline without strong prior theoretical commitments who are acting as something a bit like a jury in an adversarial system. They're voting with their feet. Um, so that as were, although the old professors may be, may be still defending some old theory, the, the students who are just deciding where to do their PhD and they're not going to study with them because, because they can see that, that it's, they're losers. Now, and so I, I think given that that mechanism is quite prevalent in in science, um, I don't think we should be surprised that it can play a role in philosophy uh, too. And and since it, it, it doesn't prevent the natural sciences from being a very uh, effective means of, of gaining knowledge, uh, it, it should not be a, such a devastating problem for philosophy either. Um, what I, I want to talk a bit about now um, is another aspect of if you like of the um the refereeing or umpiring of uh philosophical uh disputes um 
which which has to do with the the kind of rules that these disputes are carried out uh, under and the search uh, for truth. Because um, it can sometimes seem that what we're dealing with is uh, is just some sort of intellectual game, and then, and then, as we're following the stereotype, people think, well, if it's if it's an intellectual, if it's a game, then the, it's not uh, involved in the the search uh, for truth. Um, and um, and I want to to bring out ways in which that's a false contrast. Um, and so we could. Start by mentioning it, um, in medieval times, uh, these in in Europe, these scholastic philosophers, um, they debated uh, philosophical questions by playing um, a competitive game, which was uh, called in Latin obligatio. Sorry, that's it, that's I think my, this, um, the spelling check, checker has has. Which the has changed the Latin into the English word. It should be obligationis, um, which involved um, one side constructing arguments and the other sort of challenging their premises. And, uh, and the game. This was a game with formal rules. Um, I mean, very very formal uh, rules about the structure of premises, and you know, you had to say which which uh, premise you were going to challenge and maybe um, you know, how you were challenging it and so on. And, and there was um, an, an umpire uh, for these games who was, would be a, a, a more senior philosopher who, who would make sure that people were sticking to the rules. Um, and although it was a, a game, these rules corresponded to laws of logic. Um, and of course, the point of a law of logic is that it guarantees that if all the premises of an argument, um, which conforms to the rules uh, are true, then the conclusion uh, is also true. Um, and so these, the kind of logic games that scholastic philosophers played, they were, they were genuinely games, they were competitive games, but, but, they, but they also played a role in the search uh, for truth. Um, and this is something that, that you can also find in in modern logic. Um, so, I mean, the idea for this it actually goes back uh, to some things that that Charles Sanders Peirce uh, said. Where, in fact, when he was talking about vagueness, but the the person who, who's um, one of the people associated with the, the formalization of this is um, Jaco uh, Hintiker, uh, the Finnish uh, philosopher and logician. And he, he developed uh, something similar called uh, game theoretic semantics, um, and and so th this is a game which is uh, played uh, with respect to statements uh, in a formal language. Although I'm not, I'm not going to to formalise things uh, here because the the essential points uh, that I'm going to be making don't depend on that. Um, and in in the game, at each point, there's one player defending a. a statement and another attacking it. Um, and at each point in the game, there's just one statement which is in play, which is being attacked and defended. Um, but as the game progresses, uh, the, the statement that is in play is, I mean, it's replaced by simpler and simpler statements according to the structure of these statements until we finally get down uh, to um, an atomic statement, a, a statement which can't be... Um, Analyzed into in, into um, component statements, um, and if the atomic statement is true, then its defender wins. And but if the atomic statement is false, then the uh, attacker wins. Um, and there's a very elegant um, connection between the rules of the game um, and classical logic, and the, it's all set up in such a way that. Um, a statement is true if and only if its defender has a winning strategy. And it's false uh, if and only if its attacker uh, has a winning strategy. And because of the nature of the, the game, w w one or other will, either the defender or the attacker will have a winning strategy. 
so that there's this correlation between the the truth value of the statement and the question of which player has a, a winning uh, strategy um and and of course it's this connection with the with uh, truth which it, um helps to make this a semantics um and in effect uh, w- w- what we've got with those uh, equivalencies is uh, a, a a statement of uh, uh, truth and falsity conditions for the statements of the formal language that it's actually been played in, um, in terms of who has a winning strategy in the associated game. Um, and since this is all a bit abstract, I, I, I thought it would be worth just going through uh, some of the uh, of the rules, so that you you can uh, see how this works to and uh, to give a, a sense of how argumentation can actually be m- molded to the search for truth, given uh, appropriate rules. Um, so. The, the first example I want to take is where the statement in play is a, a universal generalization. And I, I've given the, a, a, the example of everything changes just because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple universal generalization. And of course, it's also one of um, philosophical interests. I think I, I mentioned um, Heraclitus right at the beginning of, of the lecture. And, uh, and this is a kind of statement of, of Heraclitian view. Um, uh, but the choice of change is just is just incidental. The, 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 the structural thing here is that we're dealing with a, a universal generalization. So w- what the rules say is that if the statement in play is uh, a, such a universal generalization, let's say everything changes, the rules require the attacker to select an object O. This object might, we, we, if you want, you can imagine that we have a, a, a domain of objects um, in the in the background, and all the universal generalizations are, are being understood as generalizations about this particular domain. But that's that's that aspect that's not important for these purposes. Um, what's important is that the attacker just selects an object, and the game continues with the statement "O oh, uh, changes in play." So, as it were, now you, you move to a new statement, and then the rules uh, take over for that again. Although. Uh, well, the, in this case, it would depend if if uh, the statement O changes uh, is an atomic s- statement, then um, then we've actually got down to ground level. I mean, it, you could also have uh, some logical analysis of what it is to change, which would then allow you to to make a whole lot more moves uh, in this game. But we don't need to worry about that. We're just concerned with this one move. Now, the The crucial thing is that if everything changes is false, it has a falsifying instance, a counterexample, uh, which the attacker can select as O, so that O changes uh, is false. Um, and and so, as we're roughly speaking, this will preserve the, um, the attacker's uh, winning strategy if they have one. Um, because, you know, I mean, supposing, let's let's say that um we took we we took i mean o might be a a a, a, cl- a particular cloud or something and then we would be moving from saying everything changes to um debating whether this cloud changes and perhaps we could even observe it changing um sorry but of course then that would um that would not then be a counterexample. But so the kind of thing that the, the attacker needs to do is to select something that would be, uh, would make, the, would be a counterexample. So maybe um, they might select uh, the number seven or something, so that the debate would be about whether the number seven changes. Um, whereas, of course, if everything changes is, is true, then it doesn't really matter which object the attacker selects because um, the the instance will also be true, and then that will just preserve the the w- winning strategy which the the defender uh, has. Um, 
So, in, you know, in a way, it, because it's a universal generalization, it's um, it, it's easy for it to be false because any kind of kind of example makes it false, and uh, and that corresponds to the fact that the it's the attacker who who gets to to choose the object with respect to which uh, the the play continues. Well, with with respect to a statement about that object. Um, and a second example is where we have uh, existential rather than universal uh, quantification. Um, so this, let's say that the statement in play is something changes. So the rules require now the defender to select an object O, and the game continues with the statement O changes in, in play. And that's because um, with an existential generalization, you only need one instance positive instance to make it true. Um, so if it's true, then it has a verifying instance. Let's, well, let's say the, the changing cloud uh, in this case. Um, and the, the defender can select that verifying instance as O, and, and that means that the, the simpler statement, O changes, which is now the statement in play, is true. And so that would preserve the, uh, the defender's um, winning strategy. Um, but if something changes is false, um, that would mean that nothing, in fact, nothing changes, changes an illusion, which of course some philosophers have thought. Um, it, it doesn't matter which object the defender chooses because the, the whichever one they uh, choose, uh, O changes will be false. And so that will be preserving the attacker's uh, winning strategy. Um, so, I mean, the, the, we, we could go through all sorts of logical constants here. I mean, in fact, if you look at conjunctions, things of form A and B, then they, they work very similarly to the universal generalizations. And, um, and if you look at disjunctions, things of form A or B, they work like the just, uh, existential uh, generalizations and the rules are similar too. But I think... Just for a bit of a contrast, it's, it's interesting to think about what happens when we have a negation. Um, so let's suppose that the statement in play is, uh, it's not uh, cold outside. Sorry, there should be a, a quotation mark at the end of outside there. Um, then what happens is something a bit different from before. It, the attacker and the defender, they exchange roles and the game continues with the statement, it's cold outside in play. But the person... Who's, who was the defender for it's not cold outside becomes the attacker for it's cold outside. And the person who was the attacker for it's not cold outside becomes the defender for it's cold outside. So, the, so they switch roles. And that, what that corresponds to is the fact that um, if it's not cold outside is true, then it's cold outside is false and vice versa, and similarly in the other direction. And if it's not cold outside is false, then it's called outside is true. So um, the the way in which negation switches the the truth value of the statement uh, corresponds to the switch in roles between the defender and the attacker. So again, th this is a device which means that whoever had um, a winning strategy uh, before. Um, continues to have a winning strategy when we look at the um, the simpler statement, the one that was without the neg negation. So, strictly, if you take the game theoretic semantics um, completely seriously, then it, then it uses the existence of a winning strategy to define truth and falsity. Uh, well, falsity, that's the absence of winning strategy. Um, now, I, you know, I don't think we should um, take this too uh, seriously, but uh, because it's really um, quite an idealized uh, approach. Um, so the, the player with a winning strategy may be unable to recognize the winning strategy because they're in no position to identify the, the, the verifying or falsifying instance. Uh, or um, they may not be in a position to 
um, check what the truth value of an atomic statement uh, is. So, for example, um, suppose that the statement in play was um, there is a spy, um, then the, the defender of that statement would be, um, they'd be required to choose an object, O, and, and defend the claim that O is a spy, where O would be like a name for the spy. But um, of course, uh, if they, I mean, if they don't know um, who the spy is, then, then they're not in position in a position to, to choose uh, the right object. And in fact, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in uh, that uh, position now. I mean, I, I think I, I know that there are spies in the in the world, but I don't, I don't think I know the name of any of any spy. So I would not be able to provide an instance. And so, um, this winning strategy that one player or the other has in principle, um, it, it, it may not be possible to, to implement it because they don't have the required uh, knowledge of the world. They can't, they can't identify which move uh, is in accord with their, the winning strategy, even if, in fact, they do have a winning strategy. They not, may not be able to recognize it. Um, and... Um, and I certainly don't think that that this is a good way actually to define the the nature of truth and falsity. I think that all this stuff about the the game is a kind of distraction from that um, but but I do think um that the the game theoretic semantics provides a kind of toy model of how the rules of a competitive game can be designed to make winning align with truth and losing with uh, falsity. Um, and, you know, in, you know, in, it may be that in quite a few uh, cases, we, we have enough knowledge um, that that we can you know ap apply a, a winning strategy uh, in these cases. I mean, for example, um, you know, I think you know when when philosophers are uh, are choosing counterexamples, uh, what what they're doing is that they're looking for cases where it's it's pretty clear that this is uh, a counterexample, uh, and uh, and often if you're dealing with a false statement, a false universal generalization. Um, you know, if, if you look, I mean, you don't know of each object whether it's a counterexample or not, but there may be some objects which are very clearly counterexamples. And, and so you can, um, you can uh, choose the, the right object for the game to continue with. And, and so, you know, I think that although um, it's it's a very very simple kind of model. Um, it it does show how the the choice of rules, in fact, can be designed so that the the game is in some way it's has. This tendency to to lead you to the the truth. Um, I mean, you know, what, what of, course, of course, one question that you know one would need to consider is um, how how we generalize um, those rules to uh, languages with a, a much larger expressive uh, power, natural languages, um, and you know, I, I think for for, for many. Um, kinds of construction that we have in, in natural languages, uh, something much, much more uh, complex um, is required. I mean, for example, you, you know, if you're dealing with, with statements of, of the form, most X's are Y's, uh, you, 
that's not something that one object can be a verifying or falsifying instance for. I mean, one which it's not one object which can make a most statement uh, true or false. And so you, you'll need something much more complicated. And um, you know, and I think in practice, quite a lot of philosophical discussion uh, takes place in circumstances where when nothing like those rules is available for some of the the key uh terms which are being used in the dispute but nevertheless I, you know i think it it's a, a kind of model which reminds us that even in a case where the the rules themselves seem highly artificial and I, you you might think if when you first if you just saw those uh rules um without without any explanation um, and without any mention of truth and falsity. It might not be obvious that they had any connection with truth or falsity. You really have to think about how the, um, the truth conditions of the relevant sentences to work to realize that uh, these rules, in fact, are correlated in quite a deep way with uh, the truth and falsity of the statements that are in play. So, you know, I, I think, as it were, a kind of idealized picture of a well-functioning uh, philosophical uh, community uh, would be one where uh, the, the rules of philosophical uh, disputation work in something like the rules of the game in game theoretic semantics. Um, and what we... What we would also require in such a community is that the members of it are that they're good at detecting when one of the players is cheating. Um, so, you know, in the example of the uh, the rules of um, Hintika's uh, game, which I was uh, talking about, um, it's in most cases it's it's pretty easy uh, to detect uh, whether um, somebody is conforming to the uh, the rules or, or not because it's because they are very uh, formal. But uh, e even in, in the case of that game, um, though, there are uh, ways in which it's not as easy as uh, you might think to um, to determine. Where the cheating is going uh, on, um, but under such conditions, disputation is an it's an approximate guide to truth. Let let me just uh, mention a, a couple of ways uh, in which uh, even the Hintika style games are um, subject to to kinds of cheating that. that are not so easy to detect. Um, so, so one thing um, is that when the uh, attacker or the defender has to choose an object, and then the game continues with a statement about that object, um, what what they have to do is to, in effect, provide uh, a name that's presumably a name that that people already understand uh, of the object or possibly point to it or something like that. Um, but, but one problem can be that it, it may be um, unclear whether the, the name that they provide uh, refers to anything or not. And in fact, I've already given an example uh, which illustrates that because um, I was uh, talking about the case of what you might uh, do if you were if you're attacking um, the statement that everything changes. And so the, your job would be to name an object uh, which does not change. And, and I suggested there that you might say then um, that name the number seven, and then the game would uh, be continue uh, with respect to the statement that the number seven uh, changes, because actually that seems like numbers are not the kind of thing that do change. Um, but but there, there's a kind of cheating which could be going on, which uh, 
um, which is that I've I've assumed in giving that example that um, that the words the number seven do name a particular object, and that's quite a controversial position in philosophy of uh, of mathematics. Um, I mean, Platonists uh, tend to think that. Um, that seven is is a name of a number, but there are there are plenty of uh, philosophers of mathematics who who deny that that's the way that uh, numerals like seven uh, work. So there, it's just it's simply controversial whether um, an object has been picked out, and uh, and so so that's one way in which the the rules are, are not as uh, cut and dried as as you might hope, and then. The, the other way in which they're not so cut and dry uh, is when it comes down to um, an atomic statement, one with, with where with no further structure to be um, unpacked, um, because then um, the the community has to decide who's who's won if we're thinking of it as a game, and and who's won depends on the um, the, the truth. Uh, or falsity uh, of the atomic statement that's been chosen. Um, so, for example, if the atomic statement was the number seven, so even if the community grants that the number seven is a genuine object which can be named, uh, there might also be disagreement about uh, whether the number seven changes. I mean, it seems implausible that it changes, but you could have a view on which uh, the number seven changes over time. For example, if you thought of um, the number seven as a as and picking out um, some kind of uh, the, let's say the collection of um, seven membered collections, then if objects would would were going in or out of existence, then the number of seven membered collections would also be changing. So, I mean, you could have that view. So, um, so that in deciding who's won the argument and who's lost, the the community would have to decide on the um, the truth value of uh, an atomic statement, and that, as I say, might also be a controversial matter. So, you know, it, it it's not. That the the rules of the the Hintika game um, eliminate all room for for reasonable controversy ab about um, whether a move is legitimate or about who's won and uh, who's lost. They they don't completely eliminate it, um, but nevertheless, um, those those rules. Um, are a step towards disciplining the dispute in in a way which is truth oriented, um, and you know I, I think that that in fact if you if you taped you know a bunch of reasonably well trained uh, philosophers arguing, um, you would find that that. At various points, they were doing something that was quite similar to Hintika's uh, rules. Um, that they are, uh, and in, in particular, you'd, you'd, I think you'd see that um, that they were um, in, in their treatment of counter examples and uh, and then positive examples to prove the existence of uh, to prove the truth of a, an existential statement. That that they were in effect. Obeying um, the the rules of Hintika's game, and and you actually, I mean, you sometimes um, hear people insisting on on that. They, you know, they you can hear people sometimes saying things like, it, "It's my example, so I can develop it the way I want," and um, and they're insisting on the fact that it, that as it were that it's their choice of move at that point in the uh, the game, and uh, and so. Uh, they are the ones who who decide which object it is that they're picking out, or or some analog of of that. So, you know, so I'm I'm I think that although 
one would have to idealize away from a lot of important aspects to to think of Hintika's kind of style of of lo logic games as um a way of resolving or or policing philosophical uh, disputes um they they do show the underlying uh, rationality of quite a bit of what is uh, going on and they i mean they show how the the as it were the game structure is not the kind of enemy of truth in the way that you might uh, take it to be okay so that's what i have to say about for the time being, about philosophy and um, and disagreement. Um, so, in looking forward to the lecture three um, on on Monday, um, one thing that came out with the discussion of logic games is that um, philosophers are having to d deal with. Um, rules of language or you might think of of thought um associated uh with um various logically significant uh expressions in our language and um and that kind of prompts the the thought well you know may, maybe um for one of philosophers main jobs is somehow to be the um, the people who police the rules of our language, or maybe also people who construct better rules uh, for our language. And um, to put it in, in the terms that are you know, that I've taken the title of lecture three from, I mean, they might think that it's it's their job to be clarifying the rules of of the language, and. Um, in lecture three, I'm going to be uh, examining uh, such a conception of uh, philosophy. I mean, I d in the end, I don't think it's a correct conception, but you can see uh, various kinds of uh, attraction it has for some philosophers. So uh, I'll, s I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Chimboa, for uh, the introduction and for organizing this wonderful event. And uh, thank you to um, to Professor Williamson as well. I'm honored and thankful and thrilled to have this opportunity uh, to deliver a response to Professor Tim Williamson, one of the best philosophers of our time. Um, in his talk today, uh, Williamson presents a view regarding how dialogues and especially disputes uh, could be crucial for us to philosophize. And um, this idea resonates with me deeply. Um, in order to respond to him, I think the best way is us to raise some issues that I think are disputable and to compete against them in hopes that uh, this could eventually achieve some cooperative results in doing philosophy. Um, okay, uh, so to begin with, um, Williamson distinguishes between two different models of interpersonal communication. Generally speaking, there's an asymmetrical kind of model for learning and there's a symmetric kind. Um, in the asymmetrical model, uh, the interlocutors rather stand in a teacher versus student relation. So their conversation would be um, more like um, an, an educational process, a process where I may defer to an expert regarding an issue, since that expert is assumed to have the evidence that I don't have. Uh, but we also have the symmetric model, uh, where two parties can be pure disputants, and they can be rather competitive or adversarial. Um, and they may have competing hypotheses and disagree on what actually the case. Um, for instance, suppose one side believes P while the other side believes not P. Ideally, uh, they could eventually resolve the disagreement by gathering evidence and uh, find out, say, P is actually the case. And if so, uh, now P becomes their common knowledge. Um, also, besides... Um, Williamson has drawn multiple analogies between disputes and games. So like what's done in game theoretic semantics, um, the winning and losing conditions of a game can be defined in alignment with the content's truth and falsity. So the idea is that a dispute can be seen as a zero sum game leading to the growth of the group's common knowledge. Um, and uh, precisely in this sense, we can say that a disagreement as well 
um, although competitive, but uh, in an equally important sense, it's also cooperative since it leads to the growth of our knowledge. Um, in fact, as Williamson argues, and I agree, um, in such case, what really matters is whether the belief presented by one side is actually knowledge. So as long as we now know the answer, um, it's of only of secondary importance who used to believe otherwise. And in other words, as long as we now have uh, the answer, we know it, uh, it doesn't really matter who was wrong, who was right, et cetera. So um, if I understand it correctly, uh, this is Williamson's central idea on how we should understand disputes in general and philosophical disputes in particular. Um, well, however, uh, here's a competing hypothesis of mine. Uh, perhaps that's not the only kind of disagreement that we might have. Um, we could still have a more disputative or truly adversarial kind of disagreement, which does not directly add to knowledge. And if so, we might have a certain kind of um, philosophical disputes that are not so cooperative, at least not so cooperative in Williamson's sense. Okay, um, next slide. So um, as Williamson also puts it in his slides um, as a hypothesis, uh, philosophical disputes are competitive, but philosoph uh, philosophy through disputes is, our, uh, is a, a cooperative enterprise. Um, and as mentioned for Williamson, uh, the primary aim of intellectual cooperation is to gain more knowledge, right? Um, but my concern is uh, precisely that um, this adversarial aspect of philosophical argumentation might be in conflict uh, with the aspect of incremental knowledge. So uh, if a philosophical dispute adds to knowledge, then it's not gen genuinely adversarial. Um, if a philosophical dispute is genuinely adversarial, then we don't have a clear sense in which um, it adds to knowledge. Um, well, by the way, uh, Williamson also mentioned in his talk that, um, for example, evolutionary theorists um, may be disagreeing with creationists, but there could uh, be still some um, sense that they gain a knowledge uh, through their disagreement. But perhaps that's exactly something I'm not sure about. So I'm not sure whether um, an evolutionary biologist would agree that, um, that she will believe that her dispute with a creationist could um, in, uh, indeed lead to some um, gain of uh, more scientific knowledge. So... Um, and also, um, if we consider philosophical inquiries more specifically, um, when Williamson claims that we can gain knowledge through philosophical argumentations, it would also be interesting to know what kind of philosophical knowledge uh, does Williamson specifically have in mind? Uh, would it be general wisdoms or insights or certain sort of interpretations or something else um, through uh, philosophical inquiry? Um, okay, so uh, back to my uh, suspicion. Um, my suspicion is that we do have this latter kind of genuinely adversarial dispute that doesn't directly involve the learning of evidence or any increment of knowledge, but it's nevertheless part of our practice of philosophical inquiry. Um, and uh, in fact, I think when Williamson himself sometimes mentions the adversarial features uh, of philosophical disputes, uh, what he was really talking about should belong to this latter um, latter adversarial kind. Uh, so that's basically my big uh, picture question on Williamson's account of philosophical argument. Um, um, so in the remaining time, I'd, uh, I'd like just to explain what I mean by the truly adversarial disputes. Um, my basic idea is that um, truly adversarial dispute must be somehow disruptive. Um, but uh, let's take a look at a non-disruptive -disru kind first. So when you and I have conflicting beliefs, such as uh, P versus non-P, then of course we disagree. Uh, but this is not a disruptive kind of disagreement because you know, we're just disagreeing whether a content P is correct answer or not um, to a given theoretical question Q. Um, here I'd like to call it an intra-theoretical disagreement. Um, but when I talk about theories and meta-theories, uh, what I have in mind is not like certain specific scientific theories such um, but rather like um, Kuhn's paradigm or Kitcher's argument patterns, like Katosh, or even Carnap's um, linguistic framework. So uh, when is the disagreement intra-theoretical? Uh, we can have an example here. Uh, in a game of chess, uh, we may wonder whether, uh, say, queen to e5 is a winning move for black. 
And a verdict on this question indeed adds to our knowledge since it is a piece of factual information. But if we have disagreement regarding this question, then at the end of the day, one of us must have had a mistaken argument. Suppose that your argument is right, that moving the queen to e5 is a winning move, then I'll be simply put into checkmate and lose the game, right? Um, I can see that there's a sense in which uh, philosophical arguments do behave in this way, uh, such that we are engaged in a kind of intellectual karate, and you give me a knockdown argument so powerful that eventually I must be, uh, it must be rational not to accept your argument. Uh, however, I'm not sure how far this analogy might go. Uh, in a chess example, even if I lose the game, I were still your opponent by definition. And I might even um, return your favor by showing you a winning move next time when we play the game. Uh, but the worry is that in a genuine adversarial argumentation, generally speaking, neither side should ever be knocked down like that. Because, um, and this is my hypothesis, because in a truly adversarial dispute, it is typically the case that neither side really possesses the ruling evidence that supports themselves to count as having the right answer uh, to the right question. And if so, then no one will be uh, evidentially the winner. Um, oh, by the way, there might be the case that while well, neither of us had the evidence, but at a later time, we somehow managed to discover the evidence and we somehow find out that the evidence rules in my favor, for example, but that's just the case that I happen to be the winner as a matter of luck. So I wouldn't take this to be a genuine case of adversarial augmentation. Um, but if in an ad, uh, adversarial uh, argumentation, no one really has to answer, um, what could they be dis disputing about? Well, um, one possibility is that their dispute is not really substantial, so that, that they might be only having a verbal dispute. But um, I think there's another possibility. They could instead be engaged in a kind of extra theoretical or meta theoretical dispute in which participants could be, let's say, disagreeing over whether question Q is a proper, proper question to ask uh, for pursuing a certain generic discursive goal. Uh, of course, then, uh, the question would be, can we really have rational arguments regarding this disruptive kind of disagreement? Um, is this kind of disruptive disagreement resolvable? Um, I have to admit that I don't have a definitive answer to this such question, but perhaps we can take a hint from Williamson here in his talk today, he has shown us that there are actually many general rules that we are expected to follow, uh, even for doing philosophy. So perhaps even in an adversarial argumentation, we do have some general expectations, at least, about what would not be a good philosophical question. Um, in other words, although an adversarial argumentation might not be really informative or productive, uh, nevertheless, it might be help, uh, help us to discard some unfit questions while focusing on new and hopefully better questions instead. And anyway, uh, regardless whether any argument could be really resolved in this way, uh, I'm sure that at least it creates more space for us to not only be uh, charitable, cooperative inter interlocutors, but in the meantime, um, be obstinate adversaries uh, of each other in a disagreement. Uh, so thank you. So I, I don't um, have any slides. Um, I will just ask two quest questions. Um, first, um, I'm not sure whether I understand uh, Professor Williamson correctly. Um, uh, Pro Professor Williamson, you seem to think debates between philosophers are somehow like debates between lawyers. Uh, the judge or jury decides which side wins. Uh, in philosophy as well in in science, people who do not take sides before hearing the debate act like a, a judge or a, a jury. Now suppose suppose I have a debate with Ewan on the nature of knowledge, and I argue that knowledge cannot be analy analyzed, but Ewan disagree. <laughs> now. Um, uh, uh, it seems that Professor Williamson thinks um, only the audience who do not take sides before hearing the debate are qualified to judge uh, who wins the debate. To be sure, the audience, in order to be competent as a jury, uh, must have some intellectual virtues, such as being being skilled at reasoning. But Professor Williamson seemed to think that if the audience already takes sides before hearing the debate, 
between me and Yi Wen. Um, then they are not impartial, and therefore cannot serve on the jury. Um, accordingly, I think um, if that's Professor Williamson's view, then he is not qualified to judge who wins because before hearing the debate, uh, he is already committed to uh, the view that knowledge cannot be analyzed. Right? Or uh, so, so here I I, I might uh, uh, misunderstand uh, Professor Williams, Williamson's view. So um. Uh, uh, do you think that you may still be qualified to, to serve as a judge before you can, uh, because you can temporarily suspend your judgment about the issue under the debate? I think this questioning is, it is practically important because um, often um, we write a paper um, criticizing a certain philosopher's view. Journals often you know, send our papers to the philosopher that we <laughs> criticize? That's my uh, first question. Uh, my second question is about um, Professor Williams's view that in a well-functioning philosophical community, disputation is an approximate guide to truth. Um, I think my, uh, this question is connected to Ewan's uh, um, comment. Philosophers have debated on, on, on many issues uh, for, for hundreds or even thousands of years, but still disagree with each other. This persistent disagreement seems to me and also seems to other philosophers such as uh, William Lycan and uh, um, Peter Van Inbegen, um, that no philosophers know any philosophical truth, perhaps except some, some possibilities. Uh, if that's so, um, then um, disputation is not a reliable way to discover truth. So my question uh, for um, Professor Williamson is, do you think that's because philosophical community has not been well-functioning? Um, if all philosophers are intellectually virtuous and well-informed, um, would they accept the verdict of the ideal judge and acquire philosophical truth? Or do you think that even two fully intellectually virtuous and well-informed judges may end up uh, disagreeing with each other on which philosopher wins the debate? If so, how can a, a disputation be an, uh, a reliable guide to truth in a well-functioning philosophical community? That's my two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for both of you for those uh, interesting challenges. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to cover the, the points you raised. You both raised quite a number of uh, points. Um, so beginning with uh, Yi Wen's uh, comments, um, he was suggesting a kind of uh, contrast between two kinds of dispute, the adversarial um, and, and the non-adversarial ones, um, or the, at least the, or the disruptive or non-disruptive uh, ones, where on the non-adversarial side, he, he was thinking that, that one side or the other could, could simply produce a, a knockdown uh, argument um, and, and every, everything would be uh, resolved and then we'd gain knowledge, but but then suggesting that um, philosophical uh, disagreement is often not like that. Um, so uh, rather than two kinds of uh, dispute, I, I, I would suggest that what we've got um, is a sort of continuum um, where with at one end um, the two parties uh, agree on on uh, almost everything. They they have this, exactly the same theoretical framework and so on. And then there's just some one small point where they disagree. And at the other end, where where they have radically uh, different uh, approaches and theoretical frameworks and so on. And uh, I think clearly there are all sorts of intermediate uh, positions as uh, as well. Um, 
one one thing I'd say about the the question of um, w- why we don't um, get a resolution of the dispute that both sides accept in in many cases. He he, he suggested that that's because in fact neither side uh, possesses uh, decisive uh, evidence. Um, I think in in fact. Um, it may often be that um, the that one side or the other does possess uh, decisive uh, evidence, but the other side refuses to grant that it is uh, decisive. Um, so, I, you know, I think in quite a lot of our um, fairly common sense, uh, ordinary knowledge. Um, is is de- decisive on on quite a lot of matters. So, for example, um, I t- I take it that we that we know um, that um, many people know which country they live in. For example, I mean that seems like the kind of knowledge that most people have. But um, if so. Uh, if we know that many people know which country they live in, then it's part of, uh, on the view of evidence that I de- I'm defending, it's actually part of um, their evidence. The fact that, that many people know which country they live in is part of their evidence because it's something that they know. And, and that's uh, decisive uh, evidence against uh, skepticism in the sense that it, in, uh, it entails that... Uh, Various kinds of philosophical skepticism are false, but of course, it, it's not in practice going to settle the dispute because the uh, the skeptic will refuse to allow that they have such evidence. Um, and uh, and so, I, you know, I think often the pattern is that w- that one side or the other actually possesses decisive evidence, but the uh, the other side refuses to allow it as as evidence, but but still, of course, the effect is that the in practice the dispute uh, doesn't doesn't get uh, resolved. Um, so w- when when it comes to the way in which philosophical disputes lead to uh, to knowledge, um, I'm thinking that. Apart from the, the as it were, the re- ones which are relatively easy to uh, to resolve because they just depend on some detail within an agreed framework, um, that the way in which they, as it would lead directly to knowledge, is, is only to to relatively um, local bits of knowledge. So I think that um, the that, for example. When when you have a uh, a dispute with someone, you you learn something about um, as it were the what we might call the game space about the what moves can be made, and you also and you also learn something about their their position and um, and so for example, um, an evolutionary biologist who debates with a creationist, they might get some knowledge about what creationists believe. I mean, obviously, that's very a very different thing for, uh, from getting knowledge about evolutionary biology, and it's it's likely that when an evolutionary biologist debates with uh, a creationist, uh, they don't get any new knowledge about evolutionary biology from from that. I mean, they might, but it doesn't seem very likely. Um, so, the. On the of the, as well of the kind of larger scale knowledge, I think uh, I, part of what I'm suggesting is that um, the the knowledge comes about m- less indirect, less directly um, through people observing the the overall pattern of um, of these um, perhaps of many different. Um, Particular uh, debates and and so on, so that um, it it may be through th- that observation that um, that you realise that that one one side um, is is bankrupt um, and um, 
I mean, and you may see that because you see them just making kind of very, um, uh, you know, unexplanatory moves or, um, you know, so for example, you know, on the problem of evil, um, which is, you know, used as an argument against theism, um, you know, if if I see the that the uh, the theist starts having to um, inv- invoke evil caused by um, by devils or something like that, that I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, that's that tells me that they're kind of running out of plausible uh, defenses, and so it's you know, it's you, you start to realize what's a degenerating research program and what isn't, which is not something that one learns directly from one specific series of argumentative moves, but from the overall pattern and from the way in which one side is is forced to make more and more desperate ad hoc uh, hypotheses. Um, and, um, you know, and then I think you, you, you mentioned on this, maybe on the side of the, the more adversarial disruptive disputes, ones between people who uh, have uh, different frameworks um and um and so they might be disputing about whether such and such is a good question and um so i think i think often um those are cases where what one learns is is it indirect i mean in fact um you know i think the the most the most plausible way of settling disputes about, about whether such and such is a good question is is just to let let people ask the question and see where they get. Um, and um, you know, if, if the question leads on to um, some kind of fruitful uh, inquiry, then that seems to show that it's a good question. Of course, it, it won't settle the issue completely decisively because. Uh, you know the the hardliners on the other side may insist that what looks like a um, you know a a fruitful inquiry is is actually um, worthless. I mean, I've you know I I remember having an argument once uh, uh, with someone who thought that um, after Aristotle, um, natural science had had started asking the wrong questions, and and that that the whole of uh, natural science post Aristotle was was a series of of wrong questions, but I, you know, I so the people can always hold on to some extreme, but I do think in such cases it's actually um, most. I mean, many people observing the overall pattern can come to know something about um, which side is is right, even though that you know that's not doesn't have to be the immediate. Um, outcome of one particular uh, exchange. Um, and then just going on to um, Ding Ming's um, questions. Um, so, yes, I, I do think that um, it's, it's very difficult for um, philosophers to be impartial um, in in assessing disputes, um, and um, and I, you know, I, I think often that's bec- it's not it's not simply because of philosophers having some kind of psychological bias. It's it's also because the the question about you know what's appropriate evidence and uh, and w- what's a good explanation and so on that those questions are bound up both with the the first order rights and wrongs and with the sort of second order questions about who's winning the the argument so you can't i mean you can't really separate the uh the two um and i th- i think i mean you raised a good question about um the how in practice this works out with with referees for journals reviewing papers and um, I think it is it's, it's common uh, experience that um, 
it does make a, a difference whether the uh, the reviewer is sort of basically sympathetic to the the, the side that the article is on. But I think that um, o- often what what happens is that the the reviewer um, as we treats it, the the article as addressing a kind of narrower question rather than a big question about, let's say, whether externalism or internalism in epistemology is correct. They treat it as um, has this article shown that a particular argument uh, on one side uh, is wrong or that, that, that something like that, and as it were, by t- by taking the um, the question at issue to be something very specific where the the re- reviewer uh, can can give a judgment which either way without undermining their their their, their fundamental tenets um but it, you know it it is it is very it's a very tricky uh issue and i think just suspending judgment about um the issues is it, it, it's not really uh, practical because um one's judgment about the issues and one's judgment about which arguments are good, they're all bound up um, uh, together. Um, so, well, I, well, yeah, one specific thing I'll just pick up on was the kind of Van Inwagen idea that that philosophers don't know any philosophical truth. Um, and I think... The problem is that it that it's difficult to to draw a line between philosophical truths and non-philosophical truths, because um, you know, well, to take the example I was using before, um, you know, if you um, if you take the uh, the claim that um, many people know which which country they live in, um, that's it doesn't sound like a philosophical truth. It just sounds like a piece of, you know, very, very ordinary common sense. Um, but in fact, it's philosophically controversial because it, it's inconsistent with various uh, sceptical uh, doctrines. Um, and, you know, in, in Van, Van Inwagen's uh, case, um, there's, I, I mean, of course, he does all sorts of complicated footwork, but, but basically... Um, his his metaphysical view it, it entails uh, that in the natural understanding of the phrase that that, that um, there are no mountains in China. I mean, Van Inwagen's own metaphysical views entail that there are no mi- mountains in China, uh, and so um, you know, just by knowing that there are mountains in China, you know something uh, inconsistent uh, with with Van Inwagen's. Uh, metaphysics. Of course, he's got complicated things to say about about how natural language works and so on. But but um, I mean, examples like that um, suggest that it, you know, if if a philosophical truth is just anything, any any uh, truth um, that it, that is significant in, in philosophically in some way, then um, it, to say that no philosophers know any philosophical truths is basically leads you into a general kind of skepticism um, because the the kinds of um, ordinary knowledge that um, that any normal human being has are, are, are philosophical truths in the sense that they are philosophically significant but, um, they're saying something about the world which which some philosophers uh, deny and uh, and so, you know, despite uh, all the all the disagreement, uh, you know, I I think that uh, philosophers do know plenty of philosophical uh, truths, um, and um, that it, you know w- what what this shows is that um, which is something you know is is does show the limitations of disputation as a philosophical method is that you can know something but without being able to defeat opponents of it in an argument um, 
I mean, in fact, of course, I, you know, I take it that, um, you know, many ordinary people um, know, you know, they know huge amounts, but nevertheless, if they were, if they had to argue with a philosopher about them, they would probably be out argued and, and uh, defeated. Um, and, um, and so, so that the test of whether somebody knows something is, is not just decided by whether they will triumph in argument. But nevertheless, uh, you know, in the long run, argument is a way of um, extending and testing our knowledge. So w- th- those are very summary kind of responses to, to the, the questions that you raised. And again, th- there's lots more to be said, but uh, I think that's all we have time for at the moment. Thanks very much. Mm-hmm.